Hey guys, Jesse here, and today we're going to learn how to airbrush. So this tutorial is really meant for the absolute beginner. So let's just say you just bought your airbrush and compressor, and you have no idea what to do with it, or you've done some repaints in the past and you're just not happy with the results. Well, usually troubles and poor results are a result of poor prep work, um, which seems to be what well, you'll be doing more than actually painting the model. So we're, today we're going to be painting an HG Schwab Grays, which was provided to me by the Gumpla Collective. Please check out their site in the link below. And we're going to take this guy from start to finish um, airbrushing this kit. So first things first, uh, you're just going to want to cut out the pieces as you like. Some people like to snap fit the kit first, then take it apart. Personally, I like to just paint as I go and then assemble the kit in the end. Um, so I've got a piece cut out here and I've also cut out the other pieces for the torso and I'm going to take this time right now to mention that you should never ever paint on the runner. I think the problem is really apparent. Uh, the fact is you won't be able to clean up the nubs properly. You can paint this all you want but as soon as you go to cut the nubs and you can cut as close as you want to the piece you're going to have to end up sanding that nub to get it completely gone. And when you do that, you'll end up sanding off paint, and then you'll have to repaint the model again. So it's worth it to just do it right the first time and cut your pieces off the runner and then paint them individually. And another problem from painting on the runner is that the runner itself can actually get into the way of you painting it. So for example, let's say you're trying to get paint onto this part of this piece, well, this part of the runner can actually get in the way and you won't have an even uh, coat onto that piece. So uh, it really depends on how you build or how you'd like to paint your model. I like to go unit by unit, so I'll cut out all the pieces for the torso, paint those, cut out all the pieces for the head, paint those, and then until the model's complete. Some people like to cut out all the pieces and paint them all at once. Some people like to go color by color. It's totally up to you, but at the end of the day, Never paint on the runner, cut out your pieces. And so after you've got your piece cut out, you're gonna do all your normal nub cleanup. Uh, personally, I get a little bit lazy on airbrush kits when cutting out nubs. Uh, I just need the surface to be completely smooth from my sanding. So I'm not super worried about stress marks as you see here. Those will be painted up anyway. So you need to just ensure that your surface is smooth and the nub is completely gone. So uh, talking about prep work, for, for me, what I like to do, and this is very classic to painting anything, is I like to sand all my pieces. As you can see, this piece has been lightly sanded. I'll go ahead and demonstrate it here. You'll just take a fine grit sandpaper, or a sanding block in this case, this is a thousand grit, and just very lightly sand the surface. And what this does for your piece is it creates a rough surface and microscopic grooves in the piece for your primer and paint to sit in. Uh, paint and primer adheres better to rougher surfaces than smooth surfaces. And for that reason, a lot of people like to wash their pieces before painting because Bandai and other modeling companies um, use an oil to help the plastic flow into the molds of their uh, kits. And some of that oil can be left over onto the pieces when they get to you. So um, some people like to wash them. I find that Sanding the pieces will naturally get rid of that surface oil and so I don't find the need to wash <laughs> my pieces But it's totally up to you. However, I would suggest sanding them I just find that the paint sticks better in the end anyways, and it, it, it just comes out with a more even paint uh, Coverage so you've got your piece here. You've got it sanded um, another note is I, I'm gonna mention priming here, but some people will try to get away with not priming and you can do that if your color that you're painting this will be significantly dark, darker. So let's say I was going from blue here to black. I could, in theory, skip priming, but I would highly suggest still sanding the piece because you still want that rough surface for the paint to stick. Now, I'm gonna be priming with this uh, uh, Tamiya's a fine surface primer. I'm going to be using white because I'd like this build to be a little bit lighter. Um, they make primer in three different colors that I know of. White, uh, sort of a neutral gray, and black. 
Now, your primer actually does have an effect on the final color of your piece. A white primed piece painted yellow will look significantly different than a black primed piece painted with the exact same yellow. So um, be sure to know what your what kind of tone you'd like to get in the end. If you want a lighter tone, use white. If you want a darker tone, use black. And if you want a sort of neutral in-between tone, use gray. Uh, again, personally, I don't know any other colors they make you know, purely primer in, but again, for this build, I'm gonna be using white. Uh, I suggest this stuff, the Tamiya stuff is really, really, really good. But honestly, if you can just find some like, cry I used to use Krylon um, primer and that stuff worked perfectly fine. But I don't know, I'm just a big fan of Tamiya's <laughs> paints. So yeah, so we're gonna be priming this. Um, I'm gonna be painting this red, so we're gonna do like a Char's custom. So it's kind of, red is kind of a significantly different color than blue. So I, I really want a nice even tone to work with. Uh, and that's another advantage of priming and why I really encourage you prime no matter what, is to get a nice even color tone to work with across all your pieces. Trust me, it'll make your build look far more, um, I guess, coherent. So after you got your piece, you'll wanna pin it for me and for many people, I just use food sticks with alligator clips. I ordered a bunch of these on Amazon a long, long, long time ago. I got like 50, so I've been using them ever since. And all you wanna do, it's very simple, just find a part on the piece that will be like a connector. This is the great thing about Bandai kits, they're all snap fit, so there has to be something that snaps into the other piece. Uh, on this piece particularly, I know this little uh, part of the piece will never ever be seen by human eyes so I'm gonna pin it there and that gives me access to all the surfaces that I will want paint on so um, some people ask and uh, I feel like this is self-explanatory but I'll go ahead and answer it some people ask well what happens to the part that gets pinned you're not gonna get paint on it well true but again that's never ever gonna be seen by anyone so I don't care if it doesn't have paint on it um, now you may have some pieces that are too small or don't have a small enough tab uh, for the clip to get onto or is, it's just shaped in a way that you can't clip it. So I like to take off the alligator clip there and just use a bit of blue tack or some of this fun tack. Uh, you can find this in like the office section of a uh, Walmart or your local office, I guess, supply store. I'll just take a little bit of this stick it onto the end here and then take the piece and stick it on there nice thing about fun tack or blue tack or whatever it's very easy to remove so this isn't going to leave any sticky crap on your piece and again this is for pieces that may not have a part that you can clip onto but that's go that's pretty secure uh, it's not as secure as a clip so be you know be careful when handling it but it should stand <laughs> against your spray but yeah, that's what I'll do. That's what I would do for pieces that are difficult to clip. But this one isn't, so we're gonna go ahead and get this back on there. And then finally, when you've got all your pieces cut out, cleaned, and clipped, you're gonna put them onto some sort of foam block. Um, it really doesn't matter, just find a way to uh, get it on here. I'll go ahead and lift the camera here for a second. As you can see, I've got all my pieces that, for the torso that I plan to paint here uh, clipped and ready to go onto this foam block. And so the next step is, of course, priming. So let's go ahead and step outside and do this thing. All right, so now we're out here in the great outdoors and um, it's about like 41 degrees out right now, which isn't ideal. But more importantly, it's not that humid out. Uh, if it's too humid, that's you really you don't want to do any spraying when it's too humid, you know, top coating or not. Um, but because it's so cold, a lot of people or some people like to warm up the cans before spraying. Um, I used to do that, but honestly, these things are meant to work at room temperature, so I don't do it anymore. And really, I haven't found a difference between warming up the can and not warming up the can. So I don't warm up the can anymore. Um, but before we start, just to go over some uh, don'ts with the uh, primer, uh, this kind of applies to all spray painting. 
but you don't want to start spraying directly onto the piece. You want to start off the piece and go across in sort of a steady sweeping motion. And you never want to stop on the piece and just blast it with paint. You're going to clog it up and it'll get really globby and then you'll get drips and you'll have to sand it and start all over. So it's worth it to do it right the first time. Um, I've shaken this for about 60 seconds or, or so and you want to shake it uh, throughout as you're spraying. Um, in terms of distance, uh, you want to be about, you know, half a foot away. Uh, honestly, uh, you don't want to spray too close. And you don't want to spray too far, but I go about half the distance of the spray. And you'll see what I mean by that in a second. But you just want to try to get a nice even coat over your piece, uh, constantly moving your piece as you spray. So let's just go ahead and get started here. As you can see, I'm slowly just moving across the piece, just getting a nice even coat. It's okay to go over uh, already painted sides more than once. So here we've got it, oh, an even coat on there. Uh, with the white primer, it doesn't have to be completely white. You'll find that if you use black or gray, you're pretty much gonna get a nice even color throughout. But with white, we're really just looking for an even uh, base to work with. Uh, this side's a little uh, devoid of some paint, so I'll go over it a little bit more. And we'll just go over the whole thing, why not? I'm adjusting for the wind a little bit. But yeah, that part looks properly primed. And we'll do one more, just for demonstration's sake. I'll take a darker piece here. I usually shake my can in between pieces for priming, so... Don't forget to get the underside of the piece. Sometimes I tend to forget sometimes too. And that looks okay as well. So uh, you're gonna wanna let them dry for, I, I tend to let them dry overnight just because I'm paranoid, but some people like to wait at least an hour or two uh, before they start to actually take it to the airbrush. Um, you want to try to let them dry and you want to try to spray outside because this stuff, the fumes aren't good for you. And usually I would be wearing a mask, but if I did, it would kind of mess up with the audio. So um, try to let these dry outside. If it's too cold, you can take them inside, but be sure to ventilate wherever you're drying them. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and finish up these pieces and then we'll start uh, airbrushing. So we're about ready to start airbrushing, but I just wanted to take this second to talk about the paints I'll be using. So I'll be using these Vallejo Game Air and Model Air paints. Uh, these are airbrush ready paints so they can go straight into the airbrush um, and they're water based so they're really, really easy to clean out of the airbrush. Um, you can use any paint you really want. You just have to be sure to thin them down to a milky consistency. Uh, so ever so slightly thicker than water. Uh, believe it or not, I've airbrushed <laughs> using these really cheap folk art paints from Walmart. I was just sure that they were thin enough to be used properly. Um, they did cause the airbrush to clog a bit more as I was painting, but that's just because these are really, really, really cheap paints. So uh, you get what you paid for in terms of paints. Um, but that being said, yeah, depending on whatever kind of paint you're using, enamel, lacquer, or acrylic, be sure to thin with the correct thinner and clean your airbrush out with the correct thinner as well. Um, and be sure to get that paint down to a milky consistency. Um, some paints just don't really work well with um, airbrushes. I find that these testers enamels just don't, no matter how much you thin them, you just can't, they just don't work uh, very well. Uh, really, it, it just takes a bit of research and trial and error um, to, to find out which paints works and which, and which don't. But in any case, this is what I'll be using today, and let's go ahead and get to the booth and start painting. So welcome to my super duper high-tech airbrush setup, i.e. a piece of paper on the wall. Uh, I know it's not the greatest setup in, on the planet, and honestly, it's not that great for beginners either. 
Um, I would recommend building your own spray booth. Uh, there's a great tutorial. Um, I'll provide a link in the description below on how to build a really nice spray booth for under 30 bucks. So go ahead and check that out. Um, I would highly suggest doing that. Um, but let's first take a look at the final result uh, we should be expecting. So we're just going for a nice, uniform, smooth coverage, just like this. Again, this is a tutorial for the absolute beginner, so we're not doing any fancy pre-shading or highlighting or anything, just a repaint. And this is what we expect to see at the end. Again, just a nice, uniform coverage of paint. So let's talk a little bit about how to handle your airbrush and how it works and such. So this is an Iwata Neo airbrush. It's probably the best airbrush you can get in terms of um, bang for your buck. It's very cheap, but it works very well, especially for beginners. Um, so this is a gravity fed airbrush. That means the paint it, well, is gonna be gravity fed through the top here. Um, you can get some that are fed through the bottom, that's called bottom fed, but um, you'll find that those, those just don't work as well as a nice gravity fed airbrush. Uh, my compressor I'm using is a master airbrush compressor. I have no idea what the model number is. It's very old and it's very, very cheap. I plan to upgrade it, but it gets the job done. Um, so with your airbrush, there are a few things you need to know. Um, so this is the trigger up here. This is the um, reservoir. If I open up this little cap part, uh, you'll see this part sticking out here. This is the needle. And if I open that and loosen it and pull it out, you'll see that it's literally a needle. Uh, the needle is very, very important and very, very sensitive. So um, it's very important to clean the needle uh, especially well when you're cleaning your airbrush. And that being said, um, this is a tutorial purely on how to paint, how to how to paint with an airbrush. It's not a tutorial on airbrush maintenance. So if you want to learn how to clean your airbrush and maintain it and uh, get rid of clogs and etc., this is not the tutorial for you. There are many, many uh, other tutorials out there and possibly far better than mine. So if I were to do one, but yeah, I just wanted to talk about some of the few important parts of the airbrush. Out here is the nozzle. Uh, a little bit obviously and when you're cleaning your airbrush you want to make sure to clean all of this very very well personally i clean my airbrush in between uh paints like if i if i'm painting something multiple colors for example today i painted white yellow and red and now i'm about to move to a lighter red in between changing all of those paints uh, i cleaned my airbrush i didn't do a super deep clean but i did a clean that was um, good enough that i wasn't getting uh, paint kind of mixed in with uh, my new paint. So um, I'm going to go ahead and load this up with paint and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the technique. All right, so I've got this loaded up with some paint here. And just a side note, I'm not wearing a mask right now, but I highly, highly suggest and implore you to wear a mask uh, because it's far more important uh, while you're airbrushing because you're doing it inside and there's less ventilation and paint particles and you know, I'd like to use my lungs later on in life, so uh, I would like you guys to be able to as well. So <laughs> please wear a mask while airbrushing. I'm not doing it right now. I'm sacrificing my lungs for you guys <laughs> in order for good audio. So I guess thank me later. In any case, um, yeah, so I've got this loaded up with paint, and we're going to learn a little bit about the trigger. So the trigger kind of works like this. Uh, depending on how much you push down is how much air you're going to get out of it. If you can hear this... It's just blowing air. No paint is coming out of the airbrush. As you can see, it has paint, but I'm not getting any paint on my hands. Uh, pulling back on the airbrush will, on the trigger, I mean, will, uh, the, will let more paint onto the needle. So basically, if you want thin lines, you'll just pull back a little bit. If you want larger, a larger uh, spray sort of area, you'll pull all the way back. Now, practicing the sort of balance between how much to push down on the trigger and how much to pull back really just takes practice. So I would suggest in a spray booth, <laughs> getting a piece of paper like this and just practicing lines. You can see I practice lines all over this thing. I've been using the same piece of paper for ages. Um, and just practice your lines, practice uh, 
you know, creating splotches like this, draw things, uh, just understand how the airbrush works. And once you feel comfortable with it, then you can start uh, putting it to your model. Um, you know, uh, the, you'll see down here, for example, in this little blue area, you'll see some splatters there. That's a result of just too much paint uh, coming out of the airbrush and not and too much air. Um, some of these really thin lines is a you know a result of not enough air and maybe not enough paint. It, it's a very delicate balance in terms of how to use this airbrush, but all it does is take practice. And honestly, once you do it once or twice, it becomes a little natural. So uh, we're going to go ahead and take this piece we're all familiar with, and I'm just going to start airbrushing it. Now, the paint coming out of the airbrush will be incredibly thin. So in this case, you can actually start on the model. Personally, I still start off just to gauge how much paint is coming out of my airbrush and kind of like what spread I'm looking at, but um, no one would blame me if you started right on the model. Now the te technique here is pretty similar to spray painting. You want to keep moving your piece and you want to keep moving your airbrush. Never hold your airbrush straight on the piece and just blast it. So just watch me work and maybe that'll explain it a little bit better. It's looking a little more orange than red right now, but the nice thing about airbrushing is because the layers going on are so thin, uh, it doesn't take long for you to be able to do a second coat. In fact, within the time of me talking to you right now after pulling this away, I can go in with a second coat. That's looking a little bit better. Um, with airbrushing, uh, again, the layers are so thin that you may have to do several coats. But as you can see, we covered this pretty quickly and we did a second coat also pretty quickly. So what you can do is perhaps put this piece down, move on to the next piece, kind of spray all your pieces, then start over again and continue to do that until you get um, the sort of color you'd like and the coverage you like. Uh, make sure to keep moving the piece, move it in all directions, get all the areas that you want painted. And when you're done, let them dry. Uh, personally, I let them dry overnight because I'm very paranoid, but uh, air, airbrush layers tend to dry really fast. So uh, you may be able to later on in the day, continue to work on it. Um, after you're done coating all your pieces and painting them, gloss coat them gloss coat them <laughs> one more time gloss coat them because what you're going to do next is you're going to panel line and you're not going to do it with markers no 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 you're going to do a wash because going to marker panel line on paint is a no-go but you need the gloss coat to allow the panel line wash to flow down the panel lines and when you go to clean it up with thinner it won't strip the paint it'll just strip a little bit of the gloss coat then in the end after you do either your weathering or decals or whatever you decide to do, just hit it with whatever final coat you want. Gloss coat, matte coat, uh, semi-gloss, whatever you want. But that's basically it. That is airbrushing. Very, very simple. Um, it, 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 it's very simple. It's very fast. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So I'm going to finish up this, uh, the rest of this torso and head section, and we'll take a look at the finished product. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the final result. As you can see, I've got the head and body fully assembled and painted here. I did not paint the inner frame because I quite like the gray that it comes in and all that like piston detailing stuff you see in there is a result of just some hand painting. But as far as the tutorial goes, um, I have all the armor pieces painted that I wanted painted. Um, and I mean, 
that just goes to show that you can do whatever you want when it comes to painting. You can just paint the armor, you can paint all of it, or you can just paint certain pieces that you want. It's all up to you. But as you can see, it is very glossy right now. And that's because I followed my own advice and I gloss coated this uh, and did the panel lining. And I have not top coated it with my final finish, which is going to be matte because um, I do plan to weather and decal this guy up. So as far as the, as the tutorial goes, um, at this point after panel lining, you can go ahead and hit this with a matte top coat or a gloss top coat, whatever you decide you want your final finish to be. Um, or you can go on to uh, do other things such as weathering and decaling and whatever other effects you may have in mind. Um, but that's about it for the, t the tutorial. As you can see, we have a nice smooth finish all over this guy. Um, I did run into one small mistake that I made on this guy. As you can see, maybe there's a small chip right there on the chest. Um, I don't know exactly what happened. Maybe when I was assembling it, my nail rubbed against it. But in that case, if that happens to you, uh, the easiest thing to do would be to just grab a brush and the same color paint and just touch that up. Or you can sand that little area and then uh, respray over it. Shouldn't take too long. Uh, because I'll be weathering this guy, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, I, I've already got a head start on it, I suppose. But yeah, so that's, that's it for this tutorial. Um, I hope that helps. Please leave any further questions you may have in the comments below. And um, uh, the next tutorial you'll see this guy in is when I do my weathering tutorial. So stay tuned for that. In any case... Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Bye-bye.